Um, welcome everybody very much to the Trello seminar series. Um, this is the second session of the week. So we had uh, Dr. Bila from India this morning and that was fascinating. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, and apologies if you were here this morning, you've heard this already. Um, but Trellis is the charity that supports therapeutic gardening in Scotland. Uh, we provide information, training, good practice sharing, and we aim to promote the highest quality of therapeutic gardening services to enable everyone to get the best out of them. We encourage a gardening group to share their experience, to share their skills and their resources through a network of about 480 gardening groups. You'll find links to all the information and the resources online on the Trellis homepage, which obviously you've already found because you're all here today. So that's great. And that is trellisscotland.org.uk. So just a quick summary of the session today. We have a presentation which will take around 40, 45, 50 minutes, somewhere about there, so get comfy, um, followed by an opportunity to ask questions and have discussion. Uh, please use the chat feature throughout the session. You can pop questions in there and then Joan will voice them for you in the Q&A session, or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen um, and you can um, ask a question yourself. So there are subtitles available if you would like to use them. You just need to click on the, I'm pointing at the screen like you can see what I'm pointing at, <laughs> the CC button at the bottom that you can press and that will enable um, you to put that live transcript on. Near the close of the session we'll ask you to complete a survey and it would be great to get that feedback. It's really important to us. It helps inform what we do. It helps us to make what we do better. Um, so if you can complete it at the end of the session, it will come up in the chat. Otherwise, we'll also email you as well to, um, to ask for your feedback. However, it is a real privilege. Um, I think that's pretty much most of the housekeeping out of the way um, to welcome our speaker today. And that is uh, Alan Gordon from Edible Estates in Edinburgh. It was a tongue twister that I struggled with earlier on when I tried to say that. Um, Alan leads on community engagement and product development for Edible Estates. And he also supports the Clovenstone growers in their neighbourhood garden. He helps to deliver children's natural play sessions with the green team and runs community food activities. So as you can imagine, it's a varied role that keeps them very, very busy. So we're very grateful for them to taking time out this afternoon with us. So I shall now pass you over to Alan and he will share his screen and presentation on building community. Alan. Thank you, Joe. All yours. <laughs> yeah, let's see if I can get, <laughs> make this happen. Okay, so yeah, so it's really great to be here this afternoon. Uh, this is a fairly new experience for me presenting to this many people online. Um, I should say th th thanks very much for inviting me to do this, uh, Joe. It's, uh, it's good to put yourself out of your comfort zone, so I'm uh, kind of enjoying this. <laughs> um, you did quite a good job of introducing me already, I think. Um, like a lot of people who work for small charities, we all tend to wear many different hats. Um, some of which were more skilled up and suited to be wearing and others that we uh, pick up along the way. Um, but yeah, the primary kind of element of my role is uh, based around community engagement, um, although I am also a community gardener, uh, play worker some days and uh, community food and, uh, and project development, sometimes funding applications. So yeah, very varied role. Um, I like the challenge, I like the variety. Um, it's kind of what, what attracts me to a lot of it, doing all the things I, I like and uh, love doing anyway. So often it uh, doesn't feel like work and sometimes in fact it's quite hard to separate uh, what is all the things I do for fun uh, from my work. Um, but that's a good place to be, uh, I think. Um, so yeah, I work for Edible Estates. Uh, specifically, I work for Southwest Edible Estates, which is um, 
based in the southwest of Edinburgh. Um, we, I think, all of our main projects are actually within within Wester Hills, which is um, part of the southwest of Edinburgh. Um, so Edinburgh Estates was initially set up by the director uh, Greg Robertson. Um, he's, he's been curating community gardens across Edinburgh for I think now on about a uh, couple of decades now. Um, and the one that you can see in front of you on screen, hopefully, is uh, the, the, the most recent one we've built and the one that I'm going to be basing my chat around today, which is the, the Murray Burn and Hillsland Community Garden uh, in Wester Hills. Um, so Edible Estates exists as a, it's a kind of partnership of several organisations, Southwest Edible Estates, of which is one. Um, and we work together to promote community food growing and the approach that we take is particularly well suited to housing estates. Um, particularly social housing estates um, and we use food growing as a, a tool for urban regeneration and um, promoting individual health and well-being and community cohesion. Um, so I'm going to kind of touch on kind of how we get from nothing to kind of what you can see in front of you at the moment. In some ways it's still developing. Um, that big bit of grass you can see in front of the shed there is currently being transformed into a polytunnel and some of the other bits have been filled in a wee bit as well since this was taken just towards the end of uh, last year. So it's an ongoing project as well um, that we, we're, we're sort of seeing in real time here at the moment. Um, so uh, a little, little bit of background, just uh, mindful that some of the folks watching might, might not even know Edinburgh, never mind Wester Hills, but uh, Wester Hills is a, sits within the southwest um, locality of Edinburgh. And what you can see on the screen there is it's uh, roughly seven different kind of neighbour neighbourhoods or, or kind of social housing schemes that comprise Wester Hills um, and, they, and they, they all kind of um, are linked by the, the local centre there, uh, which some people would think of as the town centre, which is basically a shopping centre, which is leased out privately. Uh, it's owned, the, the land and everything is owned by City of Edinburgh Council, but it's on a, a long lease to uh, a private entity. Um, and much of that is car parking as well. So, um, yeah. What else would we say about that? So, you know, West Hills has, I think, approximately 10,000 households. Um, it's just celebrated its 50th anniversary. None of this existed 50 years ago. It was all um, small holdings and various farms um, and, and, and green belt countryside, I guess. Um, so things moved on quite quickly. Some of it's already been knocked down and rebuilt and it's currently going through another regeneration. Um, at present, we're just at the start of uh, a huge kind of probably 10 to 15 year regeneration program with City of Edinburgh Council. Uh, so that's quite exciting. Um, within this map, I've marked three green dots, which um, are where we, we have constructed uh, neighbourhood gardens in Wester Hills. We, we, we take a neighbourhood approach as we see it. So we, we've kind of grouped those separate uh, schemes there down into, in, into three sort of neighbourhoods, if you like. Calder's is the, the first garden that we constructed locally. So it's it's like its own little island and it has its own identity and it actually existed. It predates Wester Hills, so it has, um, has its own kind of feel and its own, definitely its own kind of mindset. Calders are people, people from the Calders are very proud of being from the Calders um, and don't, don't often like to be called that they're from West Wales, so you have to be mindful of that. <laughs> so very, very passionate about their community. So that was the first garden that we constructed, and I think we started that back in uh, 2014. It has about 40 growing beds that uh, families there can uh, use. Um, the second garden we constructed is, Clo is the one up in Clovenstone, and we see that garden as servicing the, the area that's marked um, in ringed in yellow next to it as well, which is loosely called Harvesters, but it's actually another two areas within that called Dunbeg and Barn Park as well. So we've kind of grouped those two areas together as we see as a, as a sort of natural kind of neighbourhood and that the garden can serve any of those people there. It's a slightly smaller garden, but it has um, about 35 growing beds um, that, that families can use. And then, you know, we've grouped uh, Dunbride and Murrayburn and Halesland as the uh, third sort of neighbourhood as we see it. So the, the garden there, although it's called the Money Burden Halesland Neighbourhood Garden, it actually serves Dunbaridon as well, but that was a bit of a mouthful to, 
to add Dun Brighton into the title for that. Um, that, that. That's the biggest garden out of the three of them, and I think, I think has approximately 50 growing spaces, but that may have increased with some of the building that's gone on over the last couple of months. Um, and that's yeah, and a new polytunnel going in as well. So that's kind of where we've got to. We're not going to build any more neighbourhood gardens in Wester Hills. We, we, we feel that uh, we've reached capacity. Westburn, just for your information, um, that's where Whale Arts are also based. That's where their, their kind of main hub is, and they have a, a bit of a growing space around their building as well. So we, we see Westburn very much as being served by, by Whale Arts in that sense as well. Um, the gardens, uh, on top of the growing beds, it would be each, each one has a large shed, we sort of would term that a community shed, so it's a space, a place to do stuff, organise, meet, and each garden has a communal community orchard around the perimeter, the inside perimeter of it as well, um, which again people um, you know, can take their fair share from. Um, so if we're going to sort of start zooming in a little bit and focusing on the Murrayburn Hillsland and Bryden area. So there's a three, three separate large housing schemes um, in that neighbourhood. Um, they're linked together by the northern end of the Greenway path. So the, the Greenway is um, an off-road pedestrian route. I suppose it would be shared, fair, fair to say that it's shared. Um, and so it would be, I guess, an active travel route as well. It, it certainly links Canal Reef Primary School all the way up to Clovenstone uh, on the previous map there jump back and show you there. So it goes all the way from here, hopefully you can see my cursor, pretty much all the way up to there and it links the two schools uh, together off-road. Um, so that's kind of a key transit route locally as well. Um, and the kind of scar of land that you can see here, so this, this there used to be some community buildings down here once upon a time. They were typically sort of prefab hut buildings. When they built Wester Hills, they built a lot of housing, but they didn't build any assets initially for people. And they just relocated people en masse. Um, there was no schools, there was no shops, there was no playgrounds. There was very, very little apart from housing. And so people um, self-organized. There was a real spirit of activism back in the, like in the 60s, 70s, when they started, uh, you know, progressing west of hills across these areas. So people out of necessity actually built their own playgrounds. They, 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 you know, people maybe mentioned Venchy playgrounds. These were short for adventure playgrounds. I can remember playing on, playing on them myself as a child. Um, and they were hugely popular, really cool. If you imagine sort of Mad Max meets adventure playground, you're kind of somewhere not too far off the mark. Super cool. Um, they've all gone now, of course, and the prefab huts that were secondhand anyway, that were brought through to create places like the Digital Sentinel, local newspaper, uh, other immunity kind of spaces, just places for people to do things, you know, meet, organise. Um, some of those huts were within that kind of greenway area, just, just next to that kind of scar of tarmac. And, in, in, and indeed, Whale Arts began their life uh, there. That used to be where they operated from before they moved out to a bespoke uh, building out in, in Westburn. So that's where we decided the the best place would be to build the neighbourhood garden there it was on that kind of ugly bit of disused tarmac that was um, typically just used for fires on bonfire night, these kind of things, um, and really not much else, a lot of broken glass, that kind of thing. Um, but how, how do we get to that point? Um, and so there's a slightly different view of the Greenway, so looking kind of up towards uh, the centre of Western Hills from here, but you can get a better idea of the, the bit of ground that uh, was identified as being a, a good candidate for progressing the neighbourhood garden. Um, I think well, I have anything else to say about that present? I think, um, no, yeah, how, how do we get from there? How do, how do we engage? How do, how do we work with, with people and uh, who has the idea for a neighbourhood garden, these things. So um, further back in time when the, the Calders and the Clovenstone Gardens were constructed, they were, they were actually constructed as projects uh, under a slightly different moniker, which at that time was Western Hills Edible Estates. So they actually began life as a, a health agency project. Um, and the health agency is, a, they've also relocated from Dunbrydon up to next to the, the local kind of centre there in a, in a I guess like a sort of P, is it a PPI build of a kind of everything under one roof 
medical center, a dentist, physiotherapy, complementary therapies, the, the idea being that, you know, people, people have got, can cross refer and can literally walk around a corner into whatever they need help with. So the health agency decided that they would like to progress some of these kind of health and well-being style gardening projects because the engagement that was, was going on at that point was telling them that that was something that people wanted to see, um, which is where the director, Greg, uh, initially would have worked as the, the sort of project coordinator for these projects. So things picked up momentum and uh, around about would have been 2006, 2017-ish, I think, it was decided that it needed to become its own thing. And uh, Southwest Edible Estates came into being at that point um, as a as a scheme as, a, as its own separate uh, uh, thing. So a two, two tier skew with a with a board of trustees comprised of local folk from um, the, you know from around three local um, gardens that we've constructed there now, um, and based on those sort of engagement activities initially, it was identified that there was appetite to construct. Uh, something down this end of Wester Hills. There's very little in Murrayburn, Dumbrowden and Hills, and they're pretty much for those three schemes of roughly 1800 households, there's probably a corner shop, which is called Michael's and everyone knows it locally. Um, but that's quite, quite mad when you think about it. The population that size has one tiny little shop um, available to them. Um, certainly if you bench market against in any sort of small village uh, of a comparable size, maybe in East Lothian, for example, or around the outskirts of Edinburgh, you would find that they would have many, many, many more things, restaurants, hotels, even post offices, pubs. There's one pub that serves the entire entirety of Western Hills, for example. Um, so they're, they're really asset poor in many, many ways. And, you know, uh, mentioned earlier that they had to create their own assets initially because they weren't provided well you know one by one those assets have fallen away or f f fell into such disrepair because they were they were already secondhand initially that um they were never replaced um as you know, went into sort of harder times through the 80s and into the 90s um when there was a, another round of regeneration and many of the high-rise buildings and things were pulled down in Wester hills um so you know you're you're starting from a point here where there there is literally nowhere for eighteen hundred households to do anything. You know, so these these I guess these ideas were initially based on a lot of feedback and engagement um, that had been done with uh, um, a, a lot of the local residents around the area. So as as Southwest Edible Estates came into being, they also employed a, a development officer, um, a lady called Stacy, who, who still works in the area. She actually runs Tasting Change. Uh, project for the health agency you now. Um, so she did a lot of work, um, particularly in the area. Well, let's move forward a screen. <clears throat> so one of one of the things that she she kind of got going was the the wee soup garden. So this was a uh, a little disused pocket of uh, space within the uh, the Halesland community. Um, I suppose it's a bit of a kind of proof of concept, a, a, a kind of let's not run before we can walk kind of thing. Um, and, you know, it was constructed um, under our existing growing youth project. So these are young adults and uh, that, you know, that, that come together uh, with my colleague Stephen at the time to construct some of the sheds, build uh, infrastructure in some of the other gardens for experience. and. Um, you know, and they, they, they seem to really enjoy that. Um, so they, they were pointed at this little little garden space that uh, was was like a lot like a lot of land around housing schemes is um, it's it's housing revenue account land which is owned and uh, administered by the council. Um, typically, that's all grass usually, um, and so from the council's perspective, they're looking to minimize the amount of uh, maintenance that they have to do in a lot of these spaces. So they're always amenable to discussing more uh, alternative uses for them, as long as it ticks certain boxes like <laughs> alleviate, alleviating any maintenance costs for them. Um, so that was progressed with this wee bit of land. Um, and 
what Stacey did around that was use that as a kind of engagement vehicle to talk more about and learn more about um, local people's aspirations for the area, uh, what other things they would like to be seeing um, there. We, we also were, did a lot of work at that point in time with, where, with kids. We had a, a, a separate sort of children's um, organisation that worked very intensively with local families to uh, work through all sorts of issues, counselling and support. Um, and so they they had good relationships with a lot of the, the young folk and other families as well. So between the two of us, we did quite a lot of engagement at that point, um, le learning about more about uh, things locally there. So you know the sorts of things we do a lot of uh, in advance of any project. There's a lot of door knocking. We go we go and knock on everyone's doors locally, um, especially all the ones around any potential site to to really understand. Um, build up a picture of what, what happens there already, what uh, hopes, fears people have, uh, concerns, um, and, and just kind of you know, build up that picture, really learn about the area. Um, we do a lot of surveys, we do a lot of listening. Um, so it, 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 as part of this, Stacey helped uh, some of the local folk there uh, set up the Murrayburn and Hillsland Community Park Association, um, which um, became and still is one of, one of the, the few actual kind of community associations locally. It used to be a hotbed of activism in West Hills at one point in time there were many many neighbourhood councils and different tenants and residents groups um, but to date you know, there isn't even a functioning community council at present. Um, you're down to the Calder's Residents Association pretty much in the Calder's area, uh, the Money Burn Hills and Community Park Association and I suppose you could include the garden associations maybe at Coldenstone and Calders as well uh, in that but other than that there is no statutory vehicle that the council needs to communicate with for anything such as the community council so um, you'll, you'll typically hear from many people in, in places like Cuesta Hills that stuff just gets done to them and they don't get engaged with they don't get asked so um, because much of the land is either housing revenue account land or parks administered um, then you tend to find that the local housing officers then make a lot of decisions about what's going to happen to that land and so um, a lot of these little spaces like the one you can see on screen at the moment um, the council particularly locally in Western Hills have over the last decade uh, spent quite a lot of time resin bond graveling them or tarmacking them um, and then putting the, the fences back around them um, not something that I'm in favour of, <laughs> I would say. Um, I suppose you could imagine it as kind of unadapting your environment for climate change, if you imagine it that way. In my head, that's what they've been doing. Um, whereas we've just discovered as part of the regeneration work that's uh, about to be progressed, they're actually going to start having to look at sustainable urban drainage systems. Um, so, yeah, we've probably wasted a decade tarmacking a lot of useful rain absorbing sort of spaces. Um, anyway, that said, <laughs> so we, we we got to the point where they, they, they created this garden. Um, the Murrayburn Hills and Community Park Association came into existence and they started to, to kind of look at uh, some other things. So um, and they started to, to, to hold events in the Greenway in that big space there, so you can see that you know, most of the folk there are standing on the, the kind of tarmac scar part there. Um, and they, they, they have, you know, it, it, comes, it came through loud and clear and it continues to come through loud and clear that um, children are one of, pro probably, ever, you know, that's top priority for everyone locally, children, there's not enough for children, they want better for their kids, like everybody, but, you know, massively so here. Um, they, they want better use of their green spaces, they want, they want to see more happening. So the, the Murrayburn Hills and Community Park Association started to, so to take on that kind of central area of green space as their kind of area of, uh, I suppose area of benefit would be one way of looking at it, um, and, and to campaign for different things happening there. So they wanted to see a neighbourhood garden there, they wanted to see a play park as part of that. So this is the kind of very early start of some of these things. Um, and, you know, we, we continue listening, we continue documenting, you know, all, all, all of this ultimately becomes parts of a, of, a, of a jigsaw. So at the same time as a lot of this was happening, 
Southwest Edible Estates would have been preparing uh, an application to the Climate Challenge Fund at this point in time, um, which was ultimately successful. Um, so, so the next one, yeah. So but whilst we're also doing that, you know, the fact that there was nothing for a lot of kids to do locally um, seems quite mad. There, there, there are a few little uh, pocket play parks here and there. They're very, very bad disrepair. Some of them have actually been this. They sort of still exist notionally, but they've, they're they're no longer maintained by the council, um, and are and will be removed um, ultimately. So, with kids and ourselves and uh, local people, decided to take matters into our own hands and do a bit of provocation and uh, bought uh, all the correct ropes and things that uh, you would need to build some swings. And make some wee gang huts and that kind of stuff. And we put them up around the trees in the uh, local greenway. We're well aware that the council weren't going to be very happy about that. Um, and their, their policy, and probably still is, is to, to remove any rope swings that they find anywhere. I mean, it's typically, to be fair, is for a good reason that, uh, you know, you don't really want swings like some of these ones going out over tarmac or slabs or, you know, there's, there's a whole different realm of uh, regulations that you need to adhere to when, when doing these things. However, we did try to be quite mindful of, of that. And that said, nobody ever got hurt and never ever caused any issue. But it clearly demonstrated the need. These, these swings were covered in kids all the time, you know. And when the council did eventually decide to come around to cut them down, I think they were met with quite a lot of displeasure. In fact, it delayed um, cutting them down for quite a while. Um, they did eventually get round to it and, then, and they were removed, but they were there for probably two or three years. Um, and meanwhile, the kids all used them regularly. So, you know, we, we, we kind of did all these wee things whilst um, the kind of main aspirations for, for gardens um, were being explored. Um, as anyone knows who's probably tried to build a community garden, whatever, it doesn't just happen overnight. So there's a lot of work needs to go in in advance of it um and and you know, even to bring it into being so it's, it's it's really kind of what do you keep doing whilst you're doing all of that and to keep people motivated and you know so we, so we're always looking for these little inter interventions being mindful of opportunities that might present themselves different ways of using people so and it's one of the nice things actually looking back through a lot of these photos for uh, this presentation is a, a, lot, a lot of these wee kids are now much bigger kids or, or even young adults in fact you know, some, some of them are 18 now, some of them actually help build the gardens now, that kind of stuff. So it's, um, it's really nice to actually kind of look back and, and see them all. Um, yeah, so our application to Climate Challenge Fund was, was approved. So it was a one year funded project. Um, I think in retrospect, it should have been a two year one. <laughs> Was, uh, the first thing that the um, funding officer <laughs> asked me when uh, when she started in the roles, why did you only apply for one year? And turned out that was because they told us to. Um, but she said, no, for that sort of project, really should do two years, which was we agreed. <laughs> it was, uh, one year. It was also, also a common bit of feedback is that the, the funding cycle doesn't particularly align very well with the growing cycle. Uh, when you're doing community growing. So if you're getting funded in April, whenever to start your project, um, if you're going to build a community garden, you're probably not going to be growing anything <laughs> until the winter, uh, typically, uh, which is not the greatest time of the year to start growing. And then if you're on a one-year project, you're pretty much finishing up in the following spring. Um, so that presented its own challenges. Um, so our, our sort of starter for 10 really was we, we need a project space um, or a house um, or whatever you want to call it uh, to, to do things whilst we build the garden to store materials to uh, shelter in the, 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 wor the worst weather. Um, so the, the first thing we did was drop a container on this big slab area that's outside of the, the neighbourhood garden um, and a colleague Wayne there you can <clears throat> just see in the, uh, the top photo there uh, poking into that. Wayne began as a community grower in the Clovenstone garden actually um, and then went on to uh, join as an actual employee of uh, Southwest Edible Estates and uh, Wayne actually now heads up our growing youth project 
uh, leading the, the, the young people in actually doing things like this, fabricating, uh, fitting out containers and building the sheds and stuff. So um, he's a great guy. He's got a really, really deep voice, proper Johnny Cash deep. <laughs> wouldn't think it to look at him, but he does. Yeah, he's a, he's a re really good guy. Um, so, yeah, myself and Wayne set about fitting out this container at that point in time and uh, getting getting it ready. And uh, we covered it with blackboard paint so that the, the, the kids could decorate it and do whatever they want. The, the very first people that will engage with you whenever you turn up anywhere to do a project of this ilk are the children. Um, and we learned very quickly uh, from the other gardens that it's far better to work proactively with children um, because they will engage with you whether you like it or not. <laughs> if, if you don't engage with them positively, you'll you'll very quickly find things flying past your head or uh, them just kind of uh, making their own amusement and fun. So it's a good strategy to always work with the children. Um, and, and with the children, you know, they bring interest from their parents as well and neighbours. And, you know, it's, it's a very good way of actually kind of engaging locally. Um, it's, 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 it's by working with local young children and the youths. It's uh, it's time well spent, in, in my opinion. And like I say, you know, you, the, oh, can't see my pen. Uh, this, this chap here, who's probably was about 14 then, whatever, he's 18 now. So he's, he's now actually working with Wayne and uh, fitting out a lot of these things and stuff like that. So yeah, he's a, an amazing young guy. The very first day I pitched up there, he was like, who are you? What are you all about? Give me the keys for your container. <laughs> I'll sort it all out for you. And you're like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, he did and, and continued to do so every week. Um, yeah, I mean, an, an amazing young guy, you know, so it's really, really nice that he's now uh, 18 and actually kind of working with us as well. And I think, he, yeah, he's got a good future ahead of him. Really good guy. Um, okay, so we got to the point where we're ready to launch the actual kind of let's build a neighbourhood garden. This is the start of the project. So you can see the container in the background there. It still hasn't got its blackboard paint on it at this point, but it's uh, it was ready for the, the launch event. So we held a, you know, a big community event. Um, we, we kind of part, you can see some sort of clay structures in the foreground a little bit there. That was um, a couple of guys called City of Play came through and they do like pop-up kind of play experience with the kids. They also do uh, tinker towns where they, they get pallets and get kids to build their own gang huts and all that kind of stuff. So um, we quite liked that and uh, we'd seen them on other things. So they came along and helped us out. We had you know, musicians come and there's a band, sort of various combinations that of whoever's available turn up and usually play music, um, you know, sort of folk kind of harps and violin or fiddles and uh, all that kind of stuff, you know, really nice kind of background music and barbecue and everything and, uh, you know, make a make a real day but we were lucky that it was a beautiful day that day so in contrast to the, the previous event where it was tipping it down um but you know you can see it was well attended Lo there's loads and loads of children locally uh, and there really is very little for them to do um so we uh sort of launched the gardening so <laughs> i guess uh where we go from that was that we, we needed to lift the tarmac from that, that, that kind of scar. And um, in order to do that, we, we, we did require, require planning permission to build a garden um, in a place like that. So, um, and of course, there's planning conditions and things like that come with that. Now, we, we probably created a bit of a headache for ourselves in terms of where to build that garden. By deciding to remove that tarmac space, it, 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 put a planning condition on this. There was a lot of soil testing and an analysis that was required. And that really slowed us down um, for that year. The tests were carried out quite quickly, but the, the analysis took an inordinate amount of time to come back and to get to the point that it would satisfy that particular condition of planning. We were pretty certain that it was absolutely going to be fine, but it was just taking ages. So whilst all of that was going on, can I just jump one slide there? Yeah, we had to kind of, work from that container as a temporary project space to do what we could. So this this is where kind of natural play started to take off in Murray Burn Hills and in Dumbrydon. So we we uh, let's see with the container rigged out there. We had loads of uh, different things for the kids to, to play with. We would go on we sort of wider adventures with them. 
uh, to places like Hills Quarry Park, up to the canal, uh, even as far as Westburn Woods, over in Westburn sometimes. Uh, and, we, and we ran it every Saturday for about three hours uh, where kids would just come along. Uh, and we could, we could have easily 30 odd kids over that three hour period. Uh, and, and right through winter, you know, they never batted an eyelid. They just, they, they just loved to be doing stuff. So we really kind of started to, to work with them quite meaningfully at that point um, and, and built a lot of really good relationships with them. They're a really nice bunch of kids. Um, we also started, because we're a climate challenge funded project, we, we, we had things that we needed to deliver, obviously outcomes uh, that come with that. So uh, we held climate conversations. Um, it was very, very much about promoting, reducing your carbon footprint and um, you know, food growing, obviously, uh, was part of that. Producing food locally, reducing food miles. Uh, we also had reducing food waste. Um, so we, we still had to deliver all these things within a one year period and without a garden at this point. So, you know, hence the, the temporary project space. So, um, so the, you know, this was us starting to, to look at working with the, the adults as well a bit. And that some, some of the parents there are, are uh, uh, came into that via the working with the children. Um, we ran shared community kind of uh, meals in the evenings on, uh, I think it was a Thursday evening, so on my next slide, I think. Yeah, and uh, we started to do sort of outdoor, a lot of, a lot of outdoor cooking with uh, very, very little resource, pretty much a couple of gas rings. And uh, we had a, a, a lady called Haley that uh, helped me with that. She, you know, she was from America. She was, um, I can't remember what it was she was qualified in, but it was, it was very much along these lines, food, children and uh, uh, changing things and yeah it was amazing watching uh, all the all the different things that these kids would happily shovel down because they'd made it themselves uh, with Haley in a, either a big walk we did it was amazing what you could use a walk for <laughs> pizzas and running it uh, quite inventive and uh, the kids loved it they, they couldn't get enough of it so we we, we would uh, get them to chop everything up get them to help with the cooking um, they'd bring parents over with them. Sometimes the parents would take the lead and make, uh, make, make the meal, that kind of stuff. So, you know, again, this was all going on whilst we're waiting for permission to start building the garden. Um, and we eventually decided we just had to kind of get on with it because we weren't sure if the soil analysis work were ever going to give us our analysis. And we, we were certain it was fine. They'd said it's fine, but it just hadn't quite made its way to the council for whatever reason. So. Um, so at this point we said, okay, we need to kind of get on with it. So the local housing contractor, I think it was a, a Robert Robertson, who were building locally at the time, had one of these kind of quid pro quo deals with the council that they, you want to build houses locally, okay, you need to do something good for the community as well. So they came along and lifted the tarmac. Um, part of that deal apparently didn't include taking it away. Um, <laughs> so we're like, that's... That's great. Um, if you just pile it up somewhere over there, then <laughs> to tell the council, um, there's still two big mounds exist in the Greenway to this day uh, that are now covered in grass, docking leaves, and daffodils as a result of that. Um, and so we, we lifted the tarmac, and a contractor came in and laid the sort of skeleton for the, the kind of main paths of the garden. So this would have been about September time, I think, um, which you know doesn't leave long till winter kicks in, and you know. We're a food growing project, so um, we really want to be growing some food. So that allowed us, you know, also at that point, a fence would have gone up around the, the, the garden as well, which you can start to see in the background and the photos there a little bit. So this is where we build the first main uh, sort of infrastructural uh, piece in the garden, so, so the, the community shed. So this is roughly the same size as a shipping container um, and with a large veranda on the front of it. So this became very nice uh, warm space if you're inside with the door shut and a heater on <laughs> but still pretty cold in winter uh, otherwise um, but it at least becomes a, an asset and somewhere people can meet do things and somewhere we can progress the, the rest of the build uh, with the community from as well um, so that was the kind of first part of went up and, and, and that was done again with uh, the existing kind of growing youth participants volunteers like uh, Ben there Big hairy Ben, as I call him, um, and uh, and we, we kind of pushed that forward quite quickly. 
Yeah, you'll see this shed is quite typical. And if you see a shed that looks a bit like this in the, uh, in a garden, it's very likely Edo Estates have had something to do with it. Um, but each time we do it, the, the design evolves and improves because usually some time served joiner volunteers and says, why are you doing it that way? That's mad. Do this. It'll save you a lot of money and it'll be much quicker. <laughs> and then we're like, oh, great. And uh, so the, this is probably the best one we've built thus far. Um, so that's the first bit of one thing. <clears throat> then on the, the back of that, we start doing the, the growing spaces and the beds. Um, and again, that was progressed and uh, worked through with volunteers from different places like Royal Bank, these kind of things that would send uh, folk along for the day to, to uh, shovel tons and tons of topsoil and mulches and things like that. Uh, plenty, you know, quite a number of local folk were involved in that. The kids, of course, wanted to be right in amongst it. Um, they were always willing to lend a hand. Yeah, it was amazing. You'd see that we, we used to have some large piles of uh, dirt and things outside the garden. And it was amazing just watching the kids use that as a playground. You know, they would turn uh, a watch tank for about, over the space of about 20 minutes to half an hour. Those kids using one of those piles of dirt as a like a skateboard ramp of some sort, an island, a volcano, a roller coaster, you know, and you're just like, wow, they've got nothing to play on here, but they can get all of that out of a pile of dirt. You know, you're like, quite amazing to, to watch. Um, so it's like, if you can't afford a playground council, just come and pile big piles of dirt up. <laughs> Kids will have great fun. So we move forward with the growing beds. The, the idea with our gardens always ultimately is that a family can come and have a bed, and use it as their own growing space, or they can get involved in, get involved in more communal growing activities in the communal spaces, like the kind of perimeter there. Where you can start to see the, the first little fruit trees going in um, around that. That would be ultimately become the, the orchard. Um, what else do we do? We we also each each of our gardens has a pretty close relationship with uh, three schools in the area as well. So these are all pupils from uh, Canal Side, uh, Canal, Side, Canal View Primary School, uh, which is just up the other end of the Greenway. And they, they also have their own school farm project that we uh, run with them in partnership as well. Um, so it's a bit like our neighbourhood garden, but kind of in microcosm, but it's embedded into their curriculum for excellence at Canal View and we supply sessional workers to, to, to run it with them. Um, so they came down and uh, helped us plant, I think it was 600 whips uh, around the garden. That didn't sound like much when we ordered it. <laughs> it turned up early. Like, oh my God, this is gonna take quite a while. Um, but they, 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 they all really got into it. It was filthy weather as well. Um, and they all got filthy as well. So did we, but the hedge has grown amazing, amazingly well. I can't believe how, how fast it really took off. Um, so the, I think the ground must've been still pretty fertile here from back when it was uh, small holdings. Yeah, really the whole garden took off very quickly. Um, so yeah, that's something we, we look to do. We, we, we work closely with all three schools and uh, they're, they're cheek by jowl with, with each uh, garden. And a lot of those kids, again, it's time well spent. Uh, we, we went in and <clears throat> even delivered some uh, climate uh, literacy kind of uh, educational activities with the kids in the schools at that point as part of the project. Uh, specifically in Canal View at that point. Um, and then the garden was, I guess, uh, some of the infrastructure was quite well advanced. So you can see the at this point, the Murray Burn Hillsland Community Park Association made an application to the Scottish government making places um, fund, and which, which they were successful in doing. So they engaged City of Play, who were the, the guys that uh, did these pop-up playgrounds that uh, came to one of our events uh, previously to, to deliver this as a, a design exercise. So they, they tasked task them basically with preparing a kind of concept design master plan for that Greenway area um, to, to kind of help coherently pull together in a nice document what the kind of community's aspirations were. Um, so they did a lot of uh, consultation. We, we also partnered, we, we kind of matched, matched um, their time matched we matched our time with uh, with them for that so we we, we kind of worked alongside them with them and the community so we we were a little bit cheeky in our ask that uh, not cheeky but we, we asked a lot of uh, typically typically at the end of such an exercise you would end up with a 
a concept design master plan, but nothing else. Um, no actual change on the ground, but we incorporated within that the, the ask to co-design and test some play structures and to actually produce some technical drawings as well. So on the, the kind of Reba, who's a royal something, something architects uh, plan of work schedule, concept design is usually only stage two. Um, and then stage three, four or five onwards, start getting into more uh, detailed design, technical design and, you know, final designs. And then eventually something happens. So we 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 were a bit necky and probably tagged uh, detailed and technical into the, the concept design phase as well. So the you know the, the kids did a lot of uh, you know they prepared their own signs which they put up on the outside of the, the garden fence about what their hopes and aspirations were, what they'd like to see improve. Um, and then the next slide, yeah, you can see the it may not look like much, but um, this this play structure is still to this day covered in kids. It was only meant to be temporary in there for maybe two months, um, but it's still there about probably two and a half years later at present. So the children actually built this and painted it uh, themselves. The, it's, it's basically a kind of scaffold pole system. And what they were really trying to do um, was, was something a little bit different, was, was to say to the council, can we community self-build a playground? Because we can do it faster and cheaper than you. Um, and in fact, you, you have no money, you have no aspiration to build a playground here. You can't even maintain the existing ones. Um, so how about we do it ourselves, like they did back in the 60s and 70s when they built the original Vinci playgrounds that were community. So harking back into that spirit, you would never be allowed to do those now. They, they would be a health and safety nightmare when you, <laughs> if you look at them, they would have contravened so many different things. But they were hugely loved and they were amazing play spaces. Um, so what we did was set a precedent here. So we, we said to the council, how would you feel if we were able to build a play structure that you were comfortable with, that was there 24 seven, but that we could work with when we come along as a, a, an agency. Um, and so we could allow the children to build their own swings on that structure, to build their own slides, build their own platforms, these kind of things. But at the end of the day, we take all that away and put it in, in a shed in the garden. Um, but what's left is still usable um, in different ways. And we met with chief technical play officers and, uh, or officer, I think there is only one. Um, and we got to the point where they said, okay, you can, you can try this. So we did. And so we proved it can be done and it's not caused any problem. Indeed, um, you know, we, we had quite a few local folk observing what was happening over time. Um, and they start to report back that old ladies were using it to beat their rugs on. That uh, some of the older kind of uh, bar star guys were coming out and doing their pull-ups and all kinds of different exercise routines on them in the mornings. Um, kids were using it. They, they used the central bit as goalposts even. Um, they also, you can see some sort of pink planters in the background there. We also built some benches with them. The, the council's estate strategy had pretty much been to remove all seating because seating equals antisocial behaviour, um, which is true if it's in the wrong place. But we positioned that we just thought their seating wasn't in the right place. Anyway, we didn't have permission to do it, but we did it anyway and built some seats with the children and bolted them to the ground. And actually, immediately, it's we, we saw three old ladies come down and have a barbecue and a glass of wine, which is, someone said, never seen that happen before. And loads of parents stop. It's the main transit route to school. They'll, they'll sit and chat on it. For, for older folk trying to get to that little shop that's around the room, there's nowhere to stop and pause and uh, take your breath or, you know, to, if they need a rest. You know, so you start to see these little things making a difference. And it didn't cause any problem. It didn't cause any social behavior because we put it in a place that we thought it wasn't going to be an issue. Uh, and if it had been, we would have moved it or removed it. But this is, we, we have more flexibility in that sense than the council do, you know, they, they, they don't have that. We can kind of try and come back and alter something if it's not quite right. You know, it tends to either be done and that's it, move on. Um, it, it's, yeah, they're, they're huge, probably hugely constrained in terms of costs and all sorts of policies and things. So, um, so yeah, so this, this we'll, we'll touch on this a bit more, but uh, that was quite a big, big thing there. So that was kind of, Finishing up just as COVID uh, swooped in. So this was meant to be the first year, uh, where were we at that point in time, sorry, 2020. Um, just as we're getting ready for the new growing season, 
and thinking this is the, the garden infrastructure is pretty advanced now, it's starting to mature, this will be the capacity build year where we'll have a kind of easy time of it. This will be the fun part and yeah, Shazam, COVID uh, swept in and uh, completely screwed up all of our plans for the year. Um, so we, like, like everyone else, we just have to kind of adapt and flex our style a bit and think, well, okay, what can we do here? So we were fortunate as a agency that, you know, the government immediately said allotment thing, allotment spaces, these sorts of things, that's fine, you should be going to them. Uh, we, we didn't run any groups, we didn't, um, we didn't feel com that, that that was an appropriate thing to be doing at the time, but we did say, you know, if, if you're a garden member, you certainly can come to the garden, don't stop doing that. Um, you know, the garden participants all have, um, the, the, the gates have a code lock on them and they can come and go 24-7 as they please and uh, you use the shed and the, the growing spaces. So in, in a, a number of folk were doing that and my colleague Steve would still be there on a Tuesday and Thursday. He wasn't running a group officially, but he was still there because he was still having to progress the garden build. So if folk were there, you know, it's a big garden. It was quite easy to stay quite far away from each other. And um, and what, what actually just happened naturally was that a wee group started to coalesce around Stephen. Stephen's a lovely chap just here, by the way. Most calm, nice person you'll ever meet. Um, and they, they, all the all the, the folk that work with them there, they, they, they love hanging out with them. So what, what just naturally started to happen was that they, they, they started to kind of move, move more to like a communal food growing, I guess, effort at that point. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, they were quite successful with uh, the, the amount of fruit and veg that they started to, to pump out of the gardens. Now, what happened at that point in time was I was pretty much diverted into uh, emergency food production. Um, the, the first thing that happened in the pandemic was that the council closed the one remaining community centre, which was the Clovenstone one, Gate 55, which is not technically in the West of Hills, but it's quite close to the perimeter of West of Hills, was also closed um, and ultimately became a COVID test centre uh, and still and still is, um, still hasn't been reopened to the public. So we, we uh, diverted my energies and a couple of other folks into emergency meal production, which um, we partnered with uh, some other folk up at the health agency and sent out uh, two two course meals uh, twice a week to people that were health agency had on their books that were shielding uh, uh, Westerhaven, who were you know, doing a lot of, the kind of cancer support up there as well, that a lot of their clients, people who were absolutely terrified of uh, coming into contact with COVID at that point, still are many of them. Um, yeah, just, you know, everything just disappeared overnight for a lot of these people. So, you know, yeah, I guess um, the, the local agencies try, tried to kind of step in and fill that breach a little bit. So what, what I ended up having was a lot of, uh, a lot of the food items that you, you, you see. Some of these started going to the local food banks. Some of them, other ingredients would make their way to our kitchen up at the health agency and we would incorporate um, food from the gardens into the meals that were getting sent out. And that allowed us actually to kind of really something we'd wanted to do for quite a while. So, it, it, you know, in a weird way, it kind of uh, worked to our advantage that we were able to really do that kind of field to fork story. Um, and I think because me and Stacey at that point were probably going mad staring at four walls, pretty much just the two of us for about seven months, we started doing a similar idea with uh, the meal end of it as well. And we created the uh, uh, West Isles Eats together, um, kind of off the back of that presence, and a, and a Facebook group, and we uh, we we made little videos about how we were making the meals that we were sending out to people. They could ask us questions. They were able to request things. We'd give them a couple of different meal options each week and say vote on whatever one you want us to prepare. That sort of stuff, and we were able to keep ourselves sane, but we were also able to kind of continue working with people. Um, and this was. This was obviously back when things were really, everyone was really full, full lockdown mode. So it was, it was quite grim for a lot of folk. Um, as you know, on the side of the growing as well, we also, as Edible States, did uh, homegrown initiatives at that point where we did the um, same, same idea. We had a lot of Facebook groups where we produced uh, little videos with Steve and the guys on how to grow your fruit and vegetables. And we would send out lots of free starter packs for windowsills, balconies, patios. Um, potato growing bags, whatever, you, know, you name it, we, we probably tried it. Um, and, and it turned out to be one of those things you're going, why weren't we doing some of this stuff anyway? Um, because they were quite actually effective as engagement tools. Um, 
you, you very quickly built up face group, Facebook groups with you know seventy to hundred members in them, um, interacting you know with you. And so by the time you got back to things relaxing a bit, you had quite a good cohort of people to to work with and you know tell more and say, well, you can now come down and come to a group in the garden, that sort of thing. Uh, bring folk in that way. Other projects that weren't as advanced, that didn't even have a garden yet, actually became quite a good project development tool because you then had exactly the sort of information, people, uh, the numbers that you would need uh, to supply by way of evidence to funding applications and that. So some of these things, we kind of thought these, these are really good things, actually. We should have been doing this sort of stuff anyway. <laughs> Why weren't we? Um, so we've you know, now, now things have relaxed a bit. We've kept some of those ideas and uh, we've, we've dropped a few, but we've, we've incorporated that in our, uh, the way we're doing a lot of stuff now as a, as a kind of normal matter, of course. Um, and then you know, over, over, as the pandemic progressed, things did start to relax a bit again. So we were able to, when we felt the time was right, move to shared community picnics again in the garden. So on a Tuesday, um, we had a community chef at this point, which is this chap here, which is a guy called Tona. Um, he he was a really really good chef, and um, he would he would start prepare the basic elements of a meal up in the healthy living centre kitchen, and then bring them down to the garden. And he would assemble them uh, in different ways in the in what's actually a second shed, which was excuse me constructed as a a natural play shed for the children initially, but we haven't been able to use that for them yet because the pandemic got in the way. So it became a kind of community chef shed in the interim. Um, so the kind of the, the tail end of the summer, we uh, would come down, we'd have these ta tagging onto the end of the growing sessions, we'd have a kind of shared picnic again, incorporating food from the garden in those meals. <clears throat> and we started to find other people coming down to use the garden space for that for further engagement activities as well. Uh, we're always very keen to see anybody coming in and using the gardens, other groups. Uh, we had re researchers with a, a researcher called May East who uh, came down to quite a number of those meals to talk, uh, particularly with um, the research she was conducting was um, what if women had designed their city or environment, how would it look? You know, would it be different? Would it be you know, this, this is the kind of research she was progressing. So she was very keen to go for walks with local women. And, and to listen to them and their experiences and uh, thoughts about moving through their, their public realm. Um, she's busy, I think, now pulling all of that together. So I'm really excited to see that analysis. I think she also did it in Portobello and I think maybe in Perth, I think. But uh, West of Hills was one of the other localities that she did. So she, she certainly came to the garden and found that uh, quite amenable uh, to do that. So it was, yeah, it was nice to see these kind of... Um, aggregation of different activities starting to happen at the same time, which is what we want to see. Um, and of course- Alan, can I just give you a wee five minute or so warning? Just please do, yes. Timing. <laughs> am I well over already or am I- uh... oh, It's good, it's great. So I don't want to stop you, but That's all right, I'll, just I'll wanna, so we've got time for questions as well. No worries. Well, don't say, say, this probably speaks for itself. You know, these guys are uh, a really nice group of folk that come together just as the growers. Um, and yeah, they've been pumping out some amazing produce. They take their fair share as growers, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they make their own juices and cordials and yeah, some of them are great cooks and things and bake all sorts of lovely stuff to bring along. So you can get an idea. There's a, a sort of aerial shot. We had uh, a drone guy I know just came in and did some <laughs> drone filming one day when we were there. But you can see it's May East down there you know, doing some research with a group of women. There's other folk just doing all sorts of random things, <laughs> having a bit of a chat, enjoying the, enjoying, enjoying being outside after that hard lockdown. Um, so you can get an idea of where the, the garden was at at that point. Like, so this space here now is becoming a, a, a huge polytunnel. These little bits are being filled in with beds. So things are, things are progressing well there. So um, what next? Um, well, as I, as I sort of mentioned, uh, Earlier, there's a kind of huge regeneration piece that's uh, just kicked off across Wester Hills that's being led by City of Edinburgh Council. Um, probably very much of the ilk that went on uh, Craig Miller a uh, decade or so ago. So huge, huge things being looked at, Every, everything really. Uh, where do we fit into all of that? Well, you know, by, by going through these making place design exercises with the Maryburn Hills and Community Park Association, etc., when 
when uh, some of these design teams from the council pitched up, you know, the first thing they were able to do as a community was go, well, here's our concept design of what we like in the Greenway area. Um, make it so. <laughs> and, uh, so the, the, the stars have all started to align quite well locally at the moment. Um, things that, that we would, you know, you're quite, you start to come up against the limitations of what you can do quite quickly when you're on projects. And it's very obvious hot running water would be a huge advantage to us in terms of community food activities. Um, a, a toilet would be really helpful. Um, that, that sort of stuff, you know, so the, these things start to become quite obvious to you. Um, so um, Stalin Brand were appointed as the, the main lead design team for the entire West Wales Regeneration. A subset of that was the, the public realm space, specifically in Dunbride and Murrayburn and Hillsland, which was uh, given to Atkins Global, who are a, a massive kind of player in the, I guess, kind of landscape architecture, engineering uh, side of uh, things. And we've, 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 we've had a lot of really positive conversations with them. They're probably quite close to releasing their initial uh, plans for feedback. Um, but uh, again, out of the making place of design exercise that uh, was conducted previously, there was an aspiration for a community hub building, not, not something, no, not a multi-million pound um, room house space centre style thing, but a, a, you know, a bespoke, uh, something a bit more like in this image, which is um, from Glasgow. And the name of it's completely escaped me, but it was basically built off site modularly, shipped there on two tro uh, trolleys, lorries, and uh, joined together on site. And uh, yeah, basically it was a kitchen annex and a, and a very usable space, but warm with a toilet, etc. You know, as, as, a, as an idea of where we're going with that. So we've actually just started the Scottish Land Fund Stage 1 feasibility work now with Callum Duncan Architects and Community Enterprise to build on that big slabbed area where the shipping container used to be uh, to, to actually build a new community hub there. Uh, similarly, on the other side of the garden where the little blue play structure was, um, as part of the uh, conversations with Atkins Global and the Council, it's not quite a done deal yet, but it's looking very, very likely that we're going to be able to community self-build an actual decent sized adventure playground for the kids there um, and we've been working to that end with a guy called John O'Driscoll who you can see a little bit of his work there in the background that uh, he's been building parks down in the Olympic Park in London and stuff um, and yeah that's going to be we're, we're going to do that with the growing youth in the community um, hopefully start that in the summer if we can um, so that's looking like it's very likely to happen now Really excited about that. Um, we've also been having chats with uh, people about an outdoor nursery, bringing something like that to Wester Hills. And we've been kind of looking at the Murrayburn and Brian Hills on end as, as somewhere that might well be suitable for that. Uh, and community factoring as well as another avenue we're exploring with the council at the moment. And that, and that would be, if you think in terms of green space management, uh, perhaps our growing youth teams would be taking on responsibility for managing their own green space locally. Um, so yeah, a lot, lot of uh, stuff going on. So quite, quite, quite excited about it in the year ahead. We've got uh, lots to get our teeth into. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that's pretty much me. So I thought we'd uh, just finish up with a, a video we made, uh, or film, I should say, we made with uh, one of our growers, Carol, last year. And this was done with uh, Media Education and Film Access Scotland as part of our uh, COP26. Um, initiative at the time so they came and taught me how to make a film and uh, Carol was in it um, so I thought um, yeah sometimes nice to hear from the people who actually are in the garden maybe that's a good way to end so I'll play that then out. Morning I'm Carol and I'm the Garden um neighborhood garden where i'm off to now if you would like to come and join me my house is down there 30 seconds away and one day i was walking to the shops and saw this being built came in to ask a few questions and was immediately interested there was nothing here to begin with the shed was practically finished the paths were laid and now it's full up to the gunnels with the uh, fruit and veg and we've harvested for two years. There was about a handful at the beginning, five of us. There's about 40 or 50 people now that come along to the garden. So I would say that was amazing. 
turn up in this garden it was just heaven I uh, work full time and I'm an unpaid carer and it gets rid of my stress and it's from my uh, mental health issues a wee bit and I just forget about all that and I go home really fresh and happy and relaxed it's amazing so this has worked for me it's done me a lot of good and what I would like to see more of is more of these gardens all over Scotland, all over Britain, all over the UK, because I know for a fact, damn truth, that it does you good. And you'll be pleased to know, Joe, that I haven't got any more to say at that point. <laughs> no, at all. Thank you so much. That was just fantastic. Um, do you want to just unshare your screen, Alan, so we can sure. see you? That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, no, that was great. And I, I hated to hated to interrupt because it was so good. Um, but I think, yeah, if we can go straight to Joan, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Yes, yes, Joe. Alan, that was brilliant. And yeah, I've got lots of questions, but I'm definitely going to go to the questions that were put into the chat because there was lots of good questions in there. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and just do the questions in kind of order that they came up. Um, so the first one, Alan, how did you get around the one year funding problem from the Climate Change Fund? Mm. Um, well, aye, we, we, we did go on to secure subsequent funding. Uh, we've been funded by investing in communities for three-year funding, uh, which uh, kicked off just as the other one finished, which was uh, fortuitous and a bit, a bit squeaky bums at the time, but uh, we got there. Um, and we've actually just been extended um, for another year with investing in communities, which is great uh, coming out of the, the pandemic. They, they offered all of the projects they'd funded the opportunity rather rather than go through like a full reapplication mm -hmm. process. It's not going to reapply, but it was a bit lighter touch, but it wasn't a given that you would get the extension. But um, but we were very pleased to hear that we have just had that, which is, buys us a bit of breathing space. So that's good. Great. Well done. That's a, um, good news. Um, the Tinker Towns, um, uh, the kids that were building their own gang huts out the palace, um, did they actually get to keep their gang huts? That they built? Uh, no. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, I, I would have let them keep them. It was up to you, but no, I think um, they did. They did the main um, Tinker Town that they did in Wester Hills, actually up in Canal View Primary School grounds, and they did it over. I think it was a February week or an Easter week, so they ran it for five days in a row. Um, I mean, the, the the practicalities of any of those kids carrying <laughs> those structures back to their own place. Uh, would have been probably insurmountable. Um, so it was all ultimately dismantled. We kept some of the pallets for uh, little things we wanted to use some for, but a lot of them were uh, put into a big skippy kind of thing and taken to the next Tinker Town, I guess, that sort of thing. So you mentioned the house, good Scots word. I think you're the only <laughs> other person I've ever heard use the word house. So that's a brilliant description for your container. The who cut open the side of that big container? Did it come? It comes like that. Um, yeah, so okay. you can buy them with different um, different styles. So it has that that had two big front opening doors, but it also had two end opening ones yeah. as well. Uh -huh. So you could kind of do whatever you wanted with it, really. Okay. Um, That's a fabulous facility to to kickstart the project. Yeah, they're about to actually refit it again. That's about to reappear uh, near the garden, and our growing youth guys are going to fit it out with a, a more up-to-date, uh, better interior. Uh, mm -hmm. They did one similar out for the another group for the Willow Herb Garden Group in Wester Hills, who's uh, had a shed, but it got burnt down during a, someone went on a bit of a fire raising spree mm -hmm. in the Calders a couple of years ago, torched the, tried to torch the school at the same time. Oh and uh, yeah, they put a shipping container back with, uh, and you know, our, our team of guys fitted it out for them and it looked really cool so they're going to do a better job on this one when it comes back again for wherever it ends up ultimately. Great okay so we're now digging up all the tarmac um, did you consider building up on top of the tarmac with raised beds? We did um, we had different mitigation strategies um, that we kicked back and forth Our, we were pretty confident that the soil was absolutely fine so the 
Yeah, we could. I mean, we could have. We could have left them on the. I see what you, yeah, sorry, the question. We could have left them on the tar, tarmac rather than lift it totally. But I think it was the right decision to remove it because it was quite grim. Um, vegetables will ultimately grow better in the ground as well than they, you know, they, than they will in planters that are just sat on concrete. They will. They will grow, but they just won't grow as well. They'll need a lot more TLC, uh, a lot more attention to to what's going on in your soil. Um, so to, 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 to have it removed, we, we thought made quite a big impact locally um, as well, uh, taking something that was just, it was quite, a, it had a very grim feel to the, the area there. Um, and it, and it, to go there now, it's completely mm. transformed how that, that end of the Greenway feels there. It's a really, really beautiful space. It's a really nice place to be now. I really enjoy being there. So, and we could have, we could have, we also considered, you know, if the soil testing had gone against us and there was some kind of contaminant found, we would have had to have geotextiled under the, under the beds as well mm. um, to, to, to build up the way again. Not, not dissimilar to growing on top of the concrete in some ways, but, um, but we, were, we were confident from what we had heard of the initial analysis that the soil was fine. And given it was small holdings originally, it was likely to be fine. But, um, and, and yeah, we, in the end, it was fine. So. Yeah, and, and yeah, the veg really grows well there. Great, thank you. Um, the fencing, um, you pointed out the fencing that was going up in the background as you were now sort of like working your way through the, the development of the garden. This kind of leads on to about what you've mentioned just in a previous answer. The fence in the background, was it there for safety or security reasons or a bit of both? And can you touch on the security of the, the garden space and how much mm -hmm. access? You did say that people have 24 hour access to the garden, but can you elaborate a wee bit, please? Yes, yeah, so there's quite quite a lot to consider. I mean, our, our ideal would be to have no fence, um, but you know, you have to match that against what you know some of the, some of the headwinds you're going to face um, as well. Um, yeah, the, I mean, a fence is also a barrier, right? It's um, and and it does fulfil. It does keep some folk out, and it does keep some folk who are inside it safer yeah. um, as well. Um, and particularly for running kids sessions, things like that. It's um, particularly during the pandemic became a much more attractive proposition for other groups on that basis that it was a fenced off outdoor space that was quantifiable in terms of pandemic, COVID spacing, et cetera, and that sort of thing. And, you know, if, you, if you're in there and you've got the gates shut, you're, you know, your kids you're working with aren't going to do a runner. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna have to do a bit of climbing first anyway. Um, I mean, it doesn't keep folk out. It doesn't keep kids, determined kids out. You know, they, 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 they can and do and have climbed over. What I would say, I mean, and, you know, all, all of the engagement work, the door knocking, all of the the work with the children sessions before the garden even exists goes a long, long way to uh, minimising, you know, problems with vandalism, etc. Locally, and and I can hand on heart say we've had very little in in, in terms of that. Thing, things do happen occasionally, but they're usually quite minor. Um, I mean, the 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 shed I referred to was in a garden that had no fence around it, for example, at the very other end of the Western Hills in, in the Calders, um, and. The fact that shed was probably there for seven odd years before someone burnt it down was quite impressive. Um, and, you know, obviously they decided to put a container back after it, but um, which is probably sensible. But um, that, that there isn't a right and a wrong answer. I mean, a lot, a lot of things people will tell you when you first pitch up to build it, I wouldn't bother doing that. That's going to get torched in two nights or whatever, you know. And then yet, it's all touch weed when I say these things. Uh, you always get twitchy around about 5th of November because um, <laughs> all of our sheds and beds are, you know, it's all larch timber as well. And uh, it's best of, you know, it looks good. It's visually very nice. It lasts a long time, um, but it is very burnable. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's not really a right or wrong answer. We, we would like to have no fence around the garden, but the, the, reali the reality is that probably wouldn't play out too well, and certainly in the short term, maybe longer term, we'll get there. Um, but it's, it's, it's working with the community and getting the community to see it as something of value that, that um, really minimises issues for you, working with the schools, working with the children. As those children age, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, they, 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 they like you, you know, you, you've got a relationship with, well, hopefully they like you. <laughs> Uh, I like to think they do. Um, 
and you know that, that helps protect uh, things they see it as something of value some somewhere they had a good time yeah so you mentioned the door knocking earlier on how do you now communicate with the local community is it via social media or are you still doing or is it word of mouth since it's so brilliant um yeah it's it's there's, again, there's no there's no one right answer, and all methods of engagement will yield something. Again, you know, I would love to be able to say which one to prioritize. Um, I think that I think the reality is you kind of just always have to do a bit of everything because they all will aggregate up to a cohort cohort of people, and it's not always. I I, I think just being there, being persistent keeping building, keeping doing, keeping talking to people. I do a lot of uh, talking, as you probably noticed. And uh, I, 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 you know, I've gone from, you know, I, I like to measure like even just like the sort of anecdotal changes and, you know, from a lot of people that don't necessarily come into the garden and get, get involved in activities, but there's a lot of like older people, you know, that, that they say, oh, I'm too old for the sun, but they, they walk around the garden with their dog every day on the outside. And I can, I can hear their perceptual shifts over time from those kind of like, oh, I don't know why you're bothering, that'll not last or whatever, to, you know, like where they're looking great today, isn't it? You know, and it's like, you know, they, they, it's really, it's a small change perceptually, but it's but it's a big change in many ways, um, these kind of things. So we, we still door knock, we still leaflet, we still social media. We, uh, we recently, uh, last year we had a, an intern from Inclusion Scotland joined joined us to actually handle our uh, social media newsletter stuff because I was a bit overwhelmed <laughs> with everything. And uh, she's been kind of we've we've kept her on after the, the internship finished. So Shannon, who's based down in Hoyek, if anyone wants uh, someone to do their comms, she's great. She works for us one day a week and uh, do a great job for anyone else. Um, yeah, we 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 use all of these methods. We still hold events. You know, it's just just always listening always listening and looking for opportunities to connect people together uh, with opportunities or to develop ideas they've got and kind of things we we do all of that we do participant surveys we, we listen to check in we did it during the pandemic so just to check in with how people were doing how they were faring and kind of what they where they thought things were going and you know what uh, what more could we be doing or should we be doing shouldn't we be doing you know that sort of thing so ongoing everything ongoing yeah and which leads on to jenny's um observation she was interested he to hear that you were still running some of the home growing kits that you had initially started sending out during covid as a result of covid and um, but you're still doing them what else do you continue to do that you started because of covid um i think the relationships with uh both food banks locally uh, probably improved more meaningfully in, the, in that sense. One runs from the Holy Trinity Church, which is down the, the money burn end of things. Um, and it's also right next to Canal View Primary School. So our school project would start to take food produce the excess from their project over to the food bank because the kids did a bit of business planning and decided they wanted to help local people, um, which was really nice of them. If uh, all businesses uh, managers thought like these kids would be in a much better position, um, and and you know it was a natural from that when the Murray Burn Garden started to pump out much more of it. Um, it was another logical place to say, okay, if you'd like some more, they also have a little cafe in there as well. And some of the things could get used in that. Um, similarly, in the Calders at the you know the other garden there, which is also in Seidel Primary School uh, corner of their grounds, um, there's a it's not a food bank as such, but it's it, it was a kind of community one-stop shop style food bank outreach extension from Broomhouse, I think is one way of looking at it. Um, by the way, we would just take um, crates of whatever was you know, available and in abundance over to the community flat and they would just add it to their fair share Friday, kind of take what you want. We, we would also put it out at uh, the community picnics, um, you know, if it was, you know, if you were at the picnic for a taking advantage of whatever meal had been prepared to be handed out um, to anybody who wanted one. You could take fresh fruit and vegetables as well from there, whatever was seasonally available um, was also an option. So the, 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 those are things that definitely have been good. The, the, the sort of uh, 
like the, the, the film we made with Carol, etc. We did a lot more filming and we were probably rubbish at it initially. Went from uh, 10 minute how to grow carrot videos to uh, when we did that film Access Scotland thing, one of the things that actually attracted me to it, but also terrified me was that the brief was, it needs to be a 90 second movie. That was the thing. <laughs> My giddy aunt, how on earth do you make a 90 second movie? Um, it turns out, I mean, that, that when I watched that, I think it's 90, it took me ages also to twig that uh, 90 seconds was, uh, was that one, one point, uh, one point five minutes, which was, of course, the uh, global warming target <laughs> to keep to. I was like, of course it is. Um, hence the 90 seconds, yeah, as a constraint. But yeah, we learned a lot about how to make better movies and, uh, that's something we're definitely going to do more of um, and more meaningful ones and, uh, and, and telling people's stories like that. We really liked that. Um, they also made one of me as well, which was uh, just as punishment for me inflicting that on Carol. So uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. So yeah, with all, all these kind of things and yeah, you know, le learning how to kind of pull all that together more cohesively, keeping your website updated, embedding these things with it, stuff like that so that it's current. It's difficult when you're a small team to stay on top of all these things. Uh, everyone, anyone who works in a, a team of that size will tell you that it's it's very difficult to do the work whilst trying to capture feedback, whilst trying to you know do do everything. It's 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 difficult at times to stay on top of all of these things, but you have to do it. Yeah, but you're doing it very successfully, which is the main thing. Well, I nearly, think we have done right. <laughs> we're nearly there with the questions. I feel like I'm interrogating here. Just a couple to go, and then I'll hand back over to Joe. Margaret was. Um, wondering um i think it was probably the, the vegetables were grown during covid but you put up a fabulous photograph of some folks outside the the shed with a vast array of vegetables did you was that was that in 2020 was that summer the summer harvest of 2020 <coughs> she was yeah. so taken by the image i think it was where would we have been at that point in time? Yeah, the, the pandemic's really messed up my timeline. I feel like <laughs> I've lost two years. Um, what are we now? 22, 2021. 20, I think I think that was 2021. It could have been 20, uh, sorry, I think that, I think it was 2020. Okay. It could have been 2021 though. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'd have to go back and check the date timestamp on the photo. Mm. Very impressive, regardless of the, of the, the summer. Okay. Um, you mentioned the uh, the beds are all for like families can take up their own beds. Do you have other groups um, that come and perhaps use a group like an Alzheimer Scotland group or a learning disability group? And how high are the raised beds? And are any of them wheelchair friendly, accessible? Okay, uh, so there's a few questions there, wasn't there? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I'll go in reverse because I forgot what the first one was. <laughs> Um, so yes, we do have some wheelchair friendly ones. We have um, we, we we do have a wheelchair user, uh, our mother and her her daughter is the, the wheelchair user uh, that come to the garden. She's she's only just about to emerge from isolation because her daughter had so many um, health needs um, and was very very vulnerable. Um, so we 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 do always have some beds anyway, but we specifically made sure we do for her. And in fact, got her to advise us on heights and ramps and test things and make sure that she was happy with them and that sort of stuff. Um, the large boards themselves, um, what would they be about? about maybe 30 centimetres typically. We can double or triple up on those, you know, as, as we feel like for, we have a lot of bespoke different styles of beds that start to appear as uh, the guys get a bit more creative. Um, but the, the, the bog standard bed is about probably 30 centimetres high, maybe. Um, and you'll need to remind me, my poor brain can't remember. Um, do you have other before. groups join and uh, like Alzheimer's yes. Scotland or? Yeah, we, 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 we do. Um, and it's something we encourage and would like to see more of. Um, and in the Clovenstone garden, for example, the nursery come in and they self-serve in that garden. They have a key to the gate and they have their own bed that they come in and use. Similarly, Clovenstone Primary School. They also have a, a key, they come in and have, they actually have a little section of the garden that they use for whatever educational purposes they want. We work kind of informally with them. Um, it's like if we're there, they kind of interact with us and we kind of help them along the way a bit. Um, we, in the Murrayburn Hills and Garden, we have, we have the assisted supported learning 
uh, a relationship with assisted support, ASLS, I can never remember what the final S stands for, but these were children that have fallen out of mainstream education, so they actually came and built the second shed that you saw in the video there as a project during the, the lockdown. Um, they, they're often looking for things to do with the children and, and to try and keep them within their own locality as well. Quite often they were having to go to other parts of the city to do things. So um, so that's been a really positive relationship that's come out of the pandemic as well, is that they've continued to come to the garden. And some of those kids have actually gone on to uh, get jobs. Uh, one, one got a job at the council recently in the sort of estate management. He came bounding down the, the greenway with his proper gear on and everything and uh, was... Yeah, he was, he was just delighted to be there. It was amazing. And uh, he was so proud of uh, the fact he was now working and was fully kitted up. And uh, that was really cool to see. Um, I know the local church, I think, did at one point in time, I can't remember what group. It was it a group? I think it might have been a homeless group they were supporting that asked if they could come down and perhaps have a bed. We're 100% happy for them to do that. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but... Uh, um, yeah, we're, 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 we're always looking to, we're, we're, we often say to other organisations, okay, if you want to come and use the gardens as a venue for anything, feel free, you know. Yeah. Super, thank you. Well, thank